Carpenter. He is the director at the Institute for Health and the Environment at the University of Albany. He has been involved since the 1980s in the research surrounding electromagnetic frequencies and electromagnetic hypersensitivity. And he's going to be joining us today to dispel some of the misinformation out there surrounding these technologies. Well, doctor, thank you so much for joining us today. So we have got so many conflicting reports coming out. You know, they're saying cell phones could cause impotence. It could cause cancer. And then other studies are saying, no, there's no correlation whatsoever. Why are there such conflicting reports? Well, there are a variety of reasons. In the first place, you don't get a positive result in every study, even when there are associations that are real. Uh, it can be a, a matter of poor exposure assessment. It can be a matter of, of too few cases and that sort of thing. In my judgment, the evidence is overwhelming that long-term cell phone use causes an increased risk of brain cancer. And part of the evidence that it's real is the fact that it only shows up on the side of the head that people normally use their cell phone on. Now for adults, it does require using a cell phone for a long period of time. The evidence is strongest after 10 or more years or 1,600 and something hours. Uh, so it, it's a prolonged exposure. Uh, but the, the big concern are the few studies that are now appearing that show that when individuals under the age of 20 use a cell phone even for a shorter period of time, the risk that they will develop brain cancer is even greater than it is with adults, some five-fold greater. And it appears that older adults are less at risk than younger adults, even for the same period of time. And this is totally consistent with what we know about other sources of exposure that lead to things like cancer, that children are by far the most vulnerable, and as, as time goes on, our bodies are... are growing less, our cells are dividing less, and there's not the same level of risk. Right. Now, yes, uh, uh, and you asked me another question, which I think is a very important one, which was, uh, which are the really dangerous frequencies? Mm -hmm. And the, the problem is we can't really answer that. Uh, I'm increasingly impressed that the kinds of cancer we see are pretty much the same, no matter what the frequency of exposure is. Uh, the evidence is very strong that uh, 60 hertz power line magnetic fields increases the risk of childhood leukemia. Now we're finding that people that live near very powerful AM radio transmission towers, Vatican Radio, for example, a uh, number of powerful stations in Korea, uh, the children that live near those towers develop leukemia more frequently than children that live far away. And furthermore, the relative risk goes down along with distance from the tower. So in both of these circumstances, the whole body is being exposed, and it appears that leukemia is the cancer of greatest concern. Now, I already said that for the cell phones, it's brain cancer we're concerned about. But there is less strong evidence than for leukemia, but there's evidence for elevations in brain cancer risk around the 60 hertz magnetic fields as well. That's both with children and with adults from occupational exposure. So I don't think that the frequency is so important. The issue of smart meters is a very interesting one. And again, we don't have a lot of studies specifically on smart meters. My big concern about smart meters is that these use very high intensity pulses. They're very brief, but they're extremely high intensity. And all of the standards are set for the aggregate exposure levels, which do fall below the FCC standards. But there is a building body of evidence, not by any means conclusive yet, that these transients, these sudden rises and falls, especially at high intensity, are much more dangerous than a steady sine wave, which is what we think of for when we talk about electromagnetic fields. Uh, that re to, to prove that requires studies of people specifically exposed to smart meters. And of course, that's going to be very difficult to do. 
because none of us are only exposed to one source of electromagnetic fields. Uh, we have the magnetic fields from the electricity in our homes and offices. We have cell phones, we have Wi-Fi, we have cell towers, we have smart meters, we have radar, we have all kinds of exposures to different frequencies. And uh, again, one of the problems is that it's almost impossible to accurately measure the total aggregate exposure. However, when there is inadequate exposure assessment in epidemiological studies, one can be certain if you still find statistically significant associations in the presence of inadequate exposure assessment, then the true risk is going to be much greater than what you would obtain in those studies with flawed assessment of what the actual exposure is. Right, and we're finding that a lot of these studies are actually put on by the wireless carriers who are, of course, are going to want to have a positive review of, of their product. But short of moving to a rural area, what can people do to protect themselves? Uh, we're hearing a lot, a lot more reports of this electro hypersensitivity. Well, you know, even moving to a rural area isn't going to be very satisfactory because, uh, it, for example, with use of a cell phone, the further you are away from the cell tower, uh, the stronger the signal that generates is generated in the phone. So uh, mm -hmm. and there are cell towers just about everywhere now. Uh, so what can people do? Well, I think there are a number of things you can do that are relatively benign. Uh, you can avoid use of a cell phone except when it has a wired earpiece, a wired connection. Uh, there's no exposure from wired connections. Uh, you can avoid having Wi-Fi in your house. Or if you have Wi-Fi, you can put the router away from the areas that people are in. Uh, I think one thing that I see as being very dangerous, again, we don't have the solid experimental evidence, but the fact that the whole country, uh, and supported by the initiatives from the Obama administration, the whole country is, is in a push to have Wi-Fi computer classrooms. Now, I'm 100% in favor of having every, every school child have access to the internet and learn to use computers, but it doesn't have to be Wi-Fi. It can be wired. And uh, there is so much evidence that at least some people, if not everybody, is going to be adversely affected by the excessive radio frequency fields that you would have if you have a computer classroom where 20 kids or 30 kids are sitting on their wireless laptops generating a room just chock full of radio frequency radiation. Right, and I, I hear a lot of the argument there is that it'll be more expensive to get, get the classroom hardwired, but it really, over the long term, it seems the cost would offset itself, just concerns for your health. Well, that's exactly right. You know, what, what is the cost of having a child develop leukemia? Uh, what is the cost of having a child in school whose learning ability is impaired because of these radio frequency radiations? Now, I need to say there that the evidence for uh, uh, EMFs impairing cognitive function is still quite weak, but there's enough evidence so that parents and teachers and school administrators should be concerned about that. And then we have this issue which is still controversial of electrohypersensitivity, that some people are unusually sensitive to electromagnetic fields, whether power line fields or radio frequency fields, and just feel ill. They, they feel mentally dull, they have headaches, they have aches and pains, uh, sometimes they're nauseous, often they have ringing in their ears, uh, and they just feel unwell. Uh, now, I, I get calls regularly from electrosensitive people. Now, they're often referred by their physician to a psychiatrist mm -hmm. uh, with the thought that this is just psychosomatic. Now, for some people, it may well be psychosomatic. But I'm convinced for other people it is not, that this is a real syndrome where uh, some people respond to these fields with a greater intensity than do others. Uh, and I think that as a, 
as a nation that tries to reduce exposures and harm to people, we should be regulating on the basis of those that are most vulnerable and most sensitive to these, these fields. I get calls all the time from people that want to know, you know, where can I go to live? Because I can't stand living where I am because of the neighbor's uh, smart meters, the Wi-Fi in the community, the cell tower next door, the cell tower on the roof of my apartment, uh, this kind of thing. And there aren't easy answers to those people, but they are clearly suffering. Uh, most of them, I suspect, from the radio frequency radiation or the power line radiation. Perhaps some of them are just uh, people that are ill for other reasons and want to blame the EMFs. But uh, I don't think that that the, radio, the electro hypersensitivity can be passed off as being only a psychosomatic disease. It's not. Absolutely, and especially as there's such a, a strong push now to get the entire country on the grid, even though we have these vulnerabilities with, with hacking and things like that, but just at the very base level, there are genuine concerns for people's health. Well, doctor, where can people go to learn more? Do you have a website that you can uh, let people know where they can get a little more information? Well, I think the major website I would refer you to is that of the Bioinitiative Report. It's www.bioinitiative.org. It's an encyclopedic uh, review of the literature on, on all EMF effects. Uh, it was initially published in 2007. It was updated in 2012. And there's a very recent 2014 update on that website. Uh, I'm always available to be contacted at dcarpenter at albany.edu. Uh, I have uh, some publications in peer-reviewed journals that I've written that, that uh, describe how I see this issue. I testified on this issue before the President's Cancer Panel a couple of years ago. Uh, so I, it's, it's a very important issue, and I think there are a number of things that individuals can do to reduce their exposure, to reduce the exposure of their families without uh, giving up uh, a contemporary style of life. We're not going to go back to a pre-wireless age, but we should respect the fact that wireless communication and electricity have associated with it risks for some people, maybe not for everybody, but certainly risks for some. And there's no evidence that the cancer risk, while it may be small relative to other cancer risks, there's no evidence that anyone is immune from, from that risk. Right. So there are things to do. Yes, and especially with our children who, who, as you say, they're the ones who are becoming extremely susceptible to this and are the most who are going to be using all of this technology. Well, thank you so much for joining us today and for everything you're doing. And it's my pleasure. Me... All right, we'll talk to you soon. Thank you. Well, it is important for us to remember that we are dealing with a relatively new technology, so I would always err on the side of caution. Like Dr. Carpenter said, it could take decades for the effects of exposure to EMFs to reveal themselves as cancer or neurological disorders. Basically, we are currently the long-term test study. So which control group are you going to be in when the data adds up? Well, thanks for watching the show tonight, and we will see you here tomorrow at 7 p.m. Central. Hi, I'm Shane Steiner. A lot of you have been following my progress using Supermail Vitality. The last 19 weeks has been an incredible experience. I was feeling a little down and lethargic during the holidays, and none of the supplements that I was taking were doing any good. That's when my longtime friend from high school, Alex Jones, introduced me to Supermail Vitality. I was a little skeptical at first. Not only would I have the energy to work out and go to the gym, but it, it was actually the changes were happening to my body. Uh, a lot more rapidly. My whole mood, my libido, everything had completely changed. The concentrated organic herbs, they stimulate your natural systems to produce the natural hormones that you need. I just really wanted to, to bulk up and hit it hard and I went in for about the first five weeks and was lifting heavy weight and just really hitting it hard and I gained 20 pounds of muscle immediately. Since that, I've decided I was going to lose some weight and slim down. I just changed up my workout a little bit and 35 pounds came off. Folks, this is not a joke. This is not a gimmick. It's real. Super Male Vitality. Available at InfoWarsLife.com.